The Monty Hall problem is one of the most infamous riddles in probability. At one point in time, it fooled thousands of people at once, some of them having literal PhDs in math. To this day, Monty Hall still messes people up. But underneath this simple problem is a question that lies at the center of statistics. So in this video, I want to explore what that connection is. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. The best way to do that is to understand the problems that statisticians face. Sometimes this includes probability problems. If you've never heard about the Monty Hall problem before, don't worry, I'm going to lay it out here. So listen carefully. You are part of a game show, and you're on stage with the game host. In front of you, there are three doors. One of these doors has a cash prize behind it. If this cash prize gets revealed, then you win. Otherwise, you get nothing. Nada. The host tells you to pick a door first. Seeing your choice, the host picks another door and tells you that the cash prize isn't behind it. But then the host does something else. After choosing his door, the host offers you a choice. You can switch your choice to the other door that wasn't picked, or you can stay with your first choice. The Monty Hall problem asks, is it better to stay or switch? I'll give you a second to pause and think about an answer. All right, time's up, here it is. When you work it out, it turns out that you're twice as likely to win when you switch to the unpicked door. By far, the easiest way to show this is to diagram it. For now, we'll assume that the cash prize is behind door A. I'll circle back to this detail after I walk through this calculation though. You, the player, picks first. You don't have any reason to prefer one door over another, so it makes sense to pick one of the doors at random with equal probability. Three doors means that they all get a one-third probability of being selected. Next, the host reacts to the player's choice and steals off a second door. If the player picks B or C, then the host can only pick the other door that doesn't have the cash prize. The host can't pick the A door, because then it makes the game unwinnable and opens him up to getting sued. That's great for the player, not great for the host's job security. But if the player picks A, then the host can choose either B or C, since neither have the prize behind them. The host has no reason to prefer one over the other, so they'll pick a door at random with one half probability. Now we come to choosing a strategy, to switch or stay. The strategy decides the door that the player will end up with, so we can work this out for each path on this diagram. Since each path involves random choices, the key is to calculate the probability that each of the paths will happen. And we can do this with the classic probability calculation. The probability that two events, A and B, happen at the same time can be calculated as the product of the probability of the first event happening and the conditional probability of the second event, given the first one happened. In this case, the first event is the player picking one of the three doors, and the second event is the host picking a second door in reaction to what the player did. Let's consider the stay strategy first. For these two paths, the probability of picking A is one third, and the probability of the host picking either of these doors is one half. So the probability that each of these paths happen is one sixth. But for these two paths, the probability that the host picks these doors is 100%, or one. So these paths each have a one third probability of happening. Since these two paths lead to A, the probability that the player wins by staying at the door is one third. But now let's consider the switch strategy. The only thing that changes are the doors that the player ends up with. The probabilities of each path are still the same. So the probability that a player wins using the switch strategy is two thirds, twice the probability of the stay strategy, and therefore the better one to take. Some of you might object that this entire calculation hinges on the assumption that the prize is hidden behind door A. It could be behind B or C, and I'm not accounting for that. In reality, the result will stay the same, no matter what door the prize is behind. To demonstrate this, let's see how this diagram changes if the prize were actually behind door B. What changes are the host's reactions. In this case, if the player picks A, then the host's only option is to pick C. But if the player picks B, then the host can pick either A or C. Compared to when the prize was behind A, the paths and path probabilities are still the same, just permuted in different ways. So the probability of winning while switching is still two thirds. And the similar calculation can be made if the prize is behind or C. From my perspective, a lot of the confusion hinges on how people think about probability. People are right to identify that in the absence of any other information, the marginal probability that any door will have the prize should be one third. The fact that the host picks a second door does not change this marginal probability. So at first glance, it feels like the host actions don't matter. But the key thing to recognize is that the host has to react to the player. His reaction actually provides information that can be leveraged to the player's advantage. 
and this information is encoded in the form of a joint probability that accounts for both what the player did and what the host did. When people think about probability, they often default to raw, marginal probabilities. They forget that these probabilities can be updated with new information via Bayes' rule. Let's do another Monty Hall problem with a twist. Everything about the original problem stays the same, but now we have a different host. And you actually know something about this new host. The new host's name is Chris. He's a good person, and he really means the best, but he's just not very good at his job. His one responsibility is to remember which door has the prize behind it and react to the player accordingly. But he has a terrible memory, probably from too many late nights of editing. As a result, I, I mean he, never actually remembers where the cash prize is. So he'll just pick one of the remaining doors at random. Knowing that, what would your strategy be? Is it still advisable to switch? Or is it better to stay? Does it even matter? Take some time to think it through, and I'll tell you what happens. In the original version, the host can correctly react to the player's choice and choose a door that will not have the cash prize behind it. But our new host doesn't do that. The original player choices remain the same, but the paths for the host choice change. Instead of avoiding the door that has the cash prize behind it, they'll pick it with 50% probability. This might not seem like much, but let's see how this plays out for the player. Under the stay strategy, these are the doors you'll end up with. Using the same probability calculation as earlier, we can see that each path has the same probability of happening, 1 sixth, meaning that the player has a 1 third probability of winning if they stay. Now let's compare this to what the result would have been if you had switched the door. Notice anything? With this new host, it doesn't matter whether you stay or switch. You'll have the same probability of winning either way. Since the host no longer reacts to the player's choice, his choice is effectively independent of the player, and he no longer provides any more useful information. You can see this numerically as well. This is the same calculation we used earlier to calculate the probability for each path. But if one event is independent of the other event, the conditional probability is the same as its marginal probability, which simplifies our probability calculation a little bit. This video was actually inspired by a friend of mine who had asked about the Monty Hall problem. In walking through the solution, my friend realized something. At first, she didn't understand why switching was so beneficial, but she also assumed that the host didn't react to the player's choice. Even though my friend didn't necessarily make the right assumption, what she said got me thinking. She was right to question why switching would be beneficial, because it's not, given her assumptions. The Monty Hall problem is actually a perfect springboard for discussing a question at the heart of statistics. Despite the prominent role that probability plays in statistics, it's a surprisingly hard concept to pin down. Depending on how you interpret it, you can get totally different ways of doing statistics. If you view probability as a long one frequency of an event, then you get frequentist statistics, the dominant mode of statistics taught today. If you view probability as subjective belief, then you get Bayesian statistics, the better way of doing statistics, don't at me. From one view, the Monty Hall problem is tricky because probability is generally tricky for most people. But the problem also highlights that different sets of conclusions can be reached if you start from different assumptions. To me, the Monty Hall problem demonstrates the value of what's called the logical interpretation of probability, which was pioneered by American physicist Edward Thompson Jaynes. The interpretation gets its name from the fact that Jaynes essentially rebuilt the Bayesian framework of statistics on the basis of logic and not gambling. To Jaynes, Probability is just a subjective belief about the plausibility of an event, in numerical form, akin to the Bayesian interpretation, but subjected it to additional constraints that gave it a sense of objectivity. By objective, Jaynes means that two people with the same assumptions about an event should assign the same probability of it happening. Conversely, if two people assign different probabilities to an event, then they must have different prior information. Instead of arguing whose assumptions were correct, it'd be more productive to share and make these assumptions explicit and learn from information you might not have had before. You might even say that the Monty Hall problem is better served by this equation, where all of these probabilities are conditioned on X, which represents someone's background information. This lets you play with all sorts of interesting variations of the Monty Hall problem. Maybe your host has an irrational fear of the letter C. That's just a dumb example, but it lets you know how interesting the Monty Hall problem can become, since you can play around with this prior information. If you're curious about Jane's work, you can find his book online for free. It's kind of a hefty read, so I've also supplied a great blog post about it here in the description. I'm sorry for the late video, it's been really crazy with conferences, job interviews, and preparing for a graduation, but I promise I'll have good news for you guys on a later date.
If you enjoyed what you saw, I hope that you liked the video and subscribe if you aren't already. In my push to 100k subscribers, I'm uploading statistics content weekly, trying to. You can also get videos sent straight to your inbox if you sign up for the channel newsletter. Alright, see you in the next one.